joining us today for the Clinical Case Review live stream event. Clinical Case Review is a monthly live stream program that takes place on the second Wednesday of the month at noon. This series provides a review of clinical cases followed by discussion. Please enter your question for our speaker in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will discuss questions at the conclusion of your presentation. To introduce our speaker, Dr. Robinson, he's a hand surgeon with Louisville Arm and Hand Surgery Group at Norton Healthcare. He's a board certified orthopedic surgeon with additional qualification in hand surgery. He completed training at the University of Louisville, including the CNKI Hand Institute, and spent an additional year focusing on hand surgery at the Philadelphia Hand Center. He now maintains a busy clinical practice that includes patients of all ages, serves as a hand consultant for Bellarmine athletes, and continues research in topics including wide awake hand surgery and scaphoid fractures. He also continues to work with the UofL Orthopedic Surgery Residency Program as gratis faculty and a research men mentor. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Robinson. Thanks, Dr. Jennings. My name is Luke Robinson, as you mentioned. I'm an arm and hand surgeon, and today we're going to talk about uh, you know, common things that I see in the office and like that you all are seeing in the office, um, and maybe how to diagnose them and some treatment options and some physical exam findings that may be helpful for you all. All good? Perfect. Okay. So as far as disclosures, uh, I, I have received educational support from MedArtis, but I have no other relevant disclosures for this talk. And as far as the top 10 of hand surgery, one thing that is very common that we see a lot of is arthritis and specifically the thumb basal joint. And uh, Generally, this is something that you see in people that will come in between 40 to 75 years old. A lot of times older patients may have this, but really complain of no symptoms. Um, there is a genetic component that makes up people that have symptomatic thumb arthritis. This is much more common in females compared to males. People may come in and complain of sharp pain with gripping and grabbing objects, um, diffuse pain in the thumb or wrist base. They may say that it aches at times. It's sore and they have a weak grip or weak pinch. Clinically, these people often have visible swelling at the thumb base. And this is a great time when radiographs do provide some help as far as diagnosis goes. Treatment involves a variety of things, but includes simple things like bracing, non steroidal uh, medicines, injections, and sometimes even surgery. And here's a picture of kind of, you know. One thing about the thumb basal joint is that it causes pain that's very hard to pinpoint for patients. So they may point that it's, you know, kind of anywhere along that thumb base is disclosed by these red circles. Um, and, and clinically, here's another patient that has, in fact, thumb CMC arthritis. Um, on the right side, you see a patient who has some swelling on the left thumb base, and that's not really present on the right side. And this is an exam I like to use called the grind test which you can see here, hopefully on the left. Let's see if this is gonna play or not for me. I'm not sure why it's not doing that. That's unfortunate. Uh, the grind test is a test we use to diagnose the thumb CMC pain. That's generally where you pull on the thumb to kind of distract the joint and you really wanna uh, move the metacarpal base up and down through the thumb basal joint with the idea that when you do that, you're kind of agitating the area that's already arthritic. And they generally have a lot of pain with this. You may also feel grinding and just generalized laxity as well when you do this. And it's important to do this on one side, but also compare it to the, to the side where they may have no issues just to get a good feel for, you know, what normal is like and what abnormal is like. And I apologize for that video won't play. Um, let's talk about trigger finger. Uh, definitely another one of the common top 10 things here we deal with in the arm and hand uh, clinic and you all likely see in the office as well. This can affect really anyone, not necessarily kids, but certainly, you know, 30 year olds up to 80 year olds and people that are at risk for this include people that have diabetes, patients that have rheumatoid arthritis or other type of inflammatory arthropathies, people that are doing repetitive work and those that have hypothyroidism. These people generally will complain of a sharp pain in the hand. It's generally always worse in the morning. Um, it may cause pain gripping and grasping items. They may report just kind of soreness or achiness in their palm. 
They also may actually report pain that's kind of in their PIP joint. So again, this pain is not necessarily localized and the patients often have a hard time localizing it. Um, and it is referred often to the PIP joint. The key to this diagnosis is point tenderness. And I think for me, it's the index finger, which is where I push at. And you wanna kind of identify and if it hurts here at the level of the A1 pulley, that's generally the problem. These patients may not have actual visible triggering on exam. They may just have point tenderness. They also may have such tenderness or locking that they can't even make a fist. But when you push on one of these spots, it generally comes up red hot and that's kind of how I confirm the diagnosis. Um, the good news is for this is that treatment is uh, very responsive to steroid injections. I'd say about 80% of people without diabetes, one injection serves as a cure for these folks. Uh, with people that do have diabetes, that curative rate definitely goes down. And there's also a risk of hyperglycemia with injection. So in a non-diabetic, a shot is a great option. In a well-controlled diabetic on pills, shots are a great option. In an insulin-dependent diabetic, um, sometimes we consider other options besides injection as first-line first line treatment. And here's a picture of a video, or a video hopefully that's probably not going to play. Unfortunately, not sure what's going on, but it just shows someone with the trigger thumb and the thumb's kind of moving up and down. You can visualize it uh, catching and locking. There we go. Thanks, McKenna. So, so that's a good example of um, triggering going on. Uh, real quick, before we get into the kind of common peripheral neuropathies in the hand and arm, um, you know, I think it's good to talk about neuropathy in general. We see a lot of it in the hand and arm office. And at times we see a wide variety of it. It's not all just simply carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel. And I think it's important to have a broad differential and be aware of the other etiologies of neuropathy in the hand uh, and arm that may manifest in the, in the clinic. Um, for cervical radic radiculopathy, for us, we use the Sperling's test to kind of confirm that diagnosis, or oftentimes you can kind of tap along the cervical spine to try to elicit a Tunnell sign. This video on the right shows uh, an example of a Hoffman's reflex. So again, this is an important part to, is, of my neuropathy exam to make sure this is not a cervical myelopathy. So unlike a radiculopathy, which is a pinched nerve root, the myelopathy involves really spinal cord damage or spinal cord uh, compression. And those patients have hyperreflexia, they may have ataxia, lower extremity weakness, and they have a positive Hoffman's reflex, which is demonstrated in this video on the right. Let's see if it'll play, maybe not. On the left, on the bottom there, that's a normal uh, exam and on the top right, you can see that when you flick the long finger, she has compensatory flexion of the index finger and thumb. Okay. And that's what the Hoffman's reflex is. Um, you know, we, part of neuropathy is peripheral compressive neuropathy, which is a lot, a lot what, what I see in the office. And that's generally most commonly carpal tunnel syndrome and cubital tunnel syndrome. We also have something called double crush uh, neuropathy or double crush phenomenon, which is where a pinch nerve in the neck as well as somewhere in the periphery, either at the cubital tunnel or carpal tunnel, you know, with these two small areas of compression, they may generate a significant amount of symptoms. So it's kind of like a, a one plus one is three here, where because of uh, multi-level compression of the nerve, symptoms are significant in the hand. Um, of note, you know, one thing to, to ask that's important is, do you have numbness in your feet? So you know, the most common cause of peripheral neuropathy is idiopathic. We're not sure why, it, why that's caused, but for me, an important part of this evaluation is asking if they have numbness in the feet to see if this is a, a diffuse polyneuropathy or more of a isolated peripheral compressive neuropathy. We also see a lot of diabetic neuropathy and alt, alt, oftentimes that is, um, you know, present along with, or, as, you know, with concomitant peripheral compressive neuropathy. So sometimes we use nerve studies to help kind of identify and tease out, is this more of a compressive problem or more of a uh, systemic or metabolic issue like in diabetic neuropathy? And generally a combination of exam, history, and sometimes nerve tests um, does help clarify the diagnosis there. Finally, there's some more kind of uh, esoteric or zebra type types of neuropathy that we see. These include you know, HIV-induced neuropathy, uremic neuropathy, amyloidosis, Lyme disease, vitamin deficiencies, and even uh, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. So I think before you talk about specifically the arm and hand compressive neuropathies, it's important to know there's a really a wide variety of presentations here. And again, exam, 
history and sometimes nerve study helps kind of delineate uh, the main culprit. We'll go to the next slide, McKenna. So on the carpal tunnel, this is certainly the most common peripheral nerve compression that we see in the arm and hand clinic. Um, and this generally, you know, people at risk for this are those that have diabetes, obese folks, uh, people that uh, have excessive alcohol use or those with hypothyroidism. Um, people unfortunately don't come in and tell you that, oh, my watch, they do occasionally, but generally they say it's their whole hand that goes numb with carpal tunnel, especially at nighttime. People say they might make it better by shaking their hand or hanging it down off the side of the bed or even warming uh, warmer cold water on their hands in the middle of the night to help kind of minimize their symptoms. Sometimes they are specific and say, hey, you know, it's not so much my small finger, but in fact, it's more my long finger or my index finger and my thumb. And when you hear things like that, immediately you go to carpal tunnel syndrome and nothing else. Um, daytime activities such as uh, driving, holding a cell phone, or even like using a weed whacker or a lawnmower may exacerbate these symptoms. Um, physical exam, Phalen's is a great test to help identify or confirm this diagnosis. There's a couple of different varieties of it. It basically involves uh, sustained wrist flexion in the wrist like this, and that increases pressure in the carpal tunnel space and causes symptoms, meaning they'll have more numbness and more tingling. Tenels, again, at the volar wrist there right along the nerve may elicit symptoms, including uh, pain or increased numbness and tingling or electric type shock going to the fingers. Carpal tunnel is mainly a clinical diagnosis. Um, you know, it's a combination of exam and history that really confirms it. But occasionally when there's uh, the water's not so clear, a nerve test does help uh, kind of elucidate the underlying nature of the symptoms and clear the water. Um, some patients present oftentimes with nighttime waking and numbness, in which case it responds well to a brace. However, some folks present and they have no symptoms of numbness at night and they present simply with even atrophy or persistent sensory deficits in the thumb, long and index finger. We're not sure why some can tolerate more underlying neuropathy than others, but for, so symptom presentation isn't always simply nighttime pain. They may present with more severe uh, disease. Treatment for this generally involves using a brace, again, ibuprofen, injection, and sometimes even surgery. Go to the next slide, McKenna. Cubital tunnel syndrome, again, this is the second most common cause of peripheral nerve compression and certainly, certainly something that we see a lot in the hand, arm and hand office. This generally manifests as numbness and tingling specific to the small finger. Um, they also, oddly enough, I think it's important to check is for dysesthesia or abnormal sensation on the dorsal ulnar aspect of the hand. P these patients may also specifically complain of weakness or kind of hand dysfunction. And that's mainly because the ulnar nerve innervates a lot of the small muscles of the hand. People at work for the, or people at risk for this, excuse me, include diabetics, um, those with uh, some type of repetitive activity where they're doing lots of hyperflexion. Um, again, things like a tenels at the elbow and the elbow flexion test do help uh, with these symptoms. And I use those to kind of confirm the diagnosis. Um, also, you know, sometimes they just, you kind of confirm, open, have them open their hand up and say, which fingers feel the most numb? with the idea that their pinky or their small finger feels not normal, but their long finger and thumb feel totally normal. When you see that, you think cubital tunnel syndrome. Again, treatment for this includes activity modification, therapy, using an elbow brace and elbow pad. And you know, at, the, at nighttime, you can put that elbow pad at night to prevent hyperflexion, but daytime, put the pad right over the, the ulnar nerve for a little bit of compression. It may just help minimize symptoms. Again, uh, NSAIDs and surgery are often helpful if symptoms are recalcitrant to conservative measures. Just open up, thumb out like this. Good, relax. Pinch really hard here, both sides. Good. So, so this is a patient I saw in the office and just to get an idea of just what the clinical exam can tell you. So. When you look at the hand on the right and the left, there's a stark difference to me. And I think the more of these you look at, the more you identify the difference. But two things right off the bat, on the, on the right hand there, there is a thick pad of muscle on the thumb. On the left hand, there's almost a, there's a true concavity of the thumb. So, that, so this patient has what is the, the muscles called APB or abductor pollicis brevis atrophy. Also on that left hand, you'll notice more atrophy. So again, on the right hand, there is a thick pad of muscle in the first web space. 
On the left hand, however, there again is concavity in that web space. And that is again, consistent with an ulnar nerve issue um, or basically intrinsic muscle problem. With, with the hand at rest, if you can just pull the picture up originally, the way the hands are resting themselves is also abnormal. On the right hand, um, and McKenna, can you just kind of go back and forth one slide without hitting the button? I'll go back, please. There you go. So right there, yeah. At rest on the right hand, the fingers are straight. It's really hard here. On the left hand, the fingers are all curved and that's indicative of clawing. So clawing is the sign of severe compressive neuropathy or just nerve dysfunction in general where it affects the muscles in the hand or the forearm. In this case, this patient had um, you know, clawing of both the index and long finger, which happens with the median nerve problem, but also clawing of the small and ring finger, which happens with an ulnar nerve problem. When you see a patient like this come into the office, a lot of antenna are raised. If this patient has no numbness at all, I think of things like ALS. Um, where it's a motor only nerve dysfunction. Other etiologies include severe cervical spine problem or perhaps uh, severe compressive neuropathy or you know, nerve injury after a, a surgery. So um, again, more history and more exam gives you more here, but just, the, just, vis just visually looking at the hand can tell you a lot about um, associated neuropathy that is on the differential diagnosis. Go next slide. What about tennis elbow? Um, I see tennis elbow every day. I'm sure you all see it in the office quite a bit. And it, for me, it's the most common cause of elbow pain in my clinic. Um, this generally involves people that are about 35 to 55 years old. And of note, this is a self-limited disease, meaning that it generally gets better on their own with time, patience, and just really benign neglect. But of some of these people that do have symptoms, they may have symptom recurrence within 18 months. Um, people often complain about simple things like pain lifting a coffee cup, and they oftentimes have no injury prior to symptoms. They report pain in the whole arm that goes from the elbow to the wrist. And the main pathology here is tendinosis. It's not necessarily an inflammatory problem, but more of a degenerative problem involving tendons at the elbow, specifically the ECRB tendon. And that tendon is mainly responsible for lifting the wrist against extension, and that's what causes symptoms. Um, these patients generally have normal or near normal elbow motion. And for me, the, the confirmatory test here is something called Maudsley's test, where you place the arms out straight like you're a zombie, and you just push down on the wrist to try to, uh, with the arms straight, and, and see if that recreates the lateral elbow pain. I'll show that next in the video. Um, I think it's a great test for tennis elbow. Also, you want to palpate, obviously, and they generally have pain. We hit the next, please, McKenna. Pain isolated to the lateral epicondyle, right where that red elbow is, and it's very pinpoint. This is not a, you know, people have diffuse complaints, but it comes down to pinpoint pain when you're doing an exam on the hand and the arm, and it hurts right at the lateral epicondyle or slightly just distal up to two to three centimeters. Treatment for this generally involves, first off, rest, benign neglect as an option, NSAIDs, therapy, a wrist brace actually helps symptoms, a counterforce brace, which is like a little elbow wrap that takes tension off your tendon may also help. Steroid injections may help, PRP may help, and surgery may help. And I, I'll put an asterisk there by treatment because I'll tell you in a, a minute about how the treatment options and do they work or are we just taking, treating patients' minds? Hard to say. You can go next slide, McKenna. Um, try hitting the button there. Should be a video, there we go. So what about treatment options? So this first paper, there's lots of options for tennis elbow. And I think the, the, the thing to think about here is that if you wanna be a charlatan and treat tennis elbow, you can because lots of things work and lots, including, not, including benign neglect or even steroid shots. So this is a paper that looked at steroid injection or just a saline injection with stretching and essentially showed that in all these groups, some who had just stretching, some who had steroids, everyone did better. The one take home message here was that the group in the steroid with the steroids did do slightly better acutely, but at one year out, the patients who had the steroid injections were actually a little bit worse off. So I, I kind of educate this to patients where you say steroid injection, I try, to, I try to avoid it. It may give you some short-term relief, but you may be worse off at a year out. 
he, he hit next, please, McKenna. And here's another paper, uh, PRP, another hot thing to use for tennis elbow. Again, this paper showed that PRP or a steroid or even a saline injection all helped symptoms. The, the take home message for this paper again included that steroid shot may give you some short term relief up to a month or six weeks. But then ultimately, um, patients are kind of doing the same at a year out. And one more, please. And finally, this is a quite interesting study out of Australia. They had about 26 patients, okay? In this study, <coughs> excuse me, 13 underwent the standard surgical procedure for tennis elbow, which is called, a, basically you debride the tendon through an incision. Um, the other 13 had a sham surgery where all they did was make an incision, look at the tendon and then sew it up. And it was randomized and blinded. So it's level one evidence, the best we got. And excuse me, randomized, but not blinded. So level two evidence. Um, but you know, examiners were blinded and the patients didn't know what they had either. And really in this group, both groups got better. So hit one more time, McKenna. I think the take a message here is that for tennis elbow, reassurance and education are the best treatments for patients. Wrist brace and counterforce brace may provide relief and also get the patient kind of active in their own care, which I think helps improvement. Steroid shots do help those that are truly miserable. And I saved those after a trial, extensive trial of non-op management. And then regarding surgery for this, generally it's a year of symptoms with failure to respond to anything. And again, and I tell them the same thing I tell them is that, you know, surgery may, surgery may help you, but also doing nothing may help you and this may get better on its own. But even with that, a small, very small subset of patients with this problem end up getting surgery uh, at, at the arm and hand office. So uh, we see this, if, you know, 25 times a week, one out of 50 might end up with a surgery. Is that her? No. This is an example of Maudsley's test. Okay. And I, I think it is a great way to confirm the diagnosis. Well, okay, yeah. okay. You, you can go next, McKenna. What about golfer's elbow? This is the second most common cause of elbow pain in my office, certainly. This probably is more likely to be associated with trauma than tennis elbow. Oftentimes people are literally playing golf here and they have a fat shot or they're at the gym lifting and they feel kind of a, some immediate discomfort in their elbow. Um, and it generally is isolated. Again, pinpoint tenderness at the medial epicondyle. About a third of these patients do have ulnar nerve symptoms. Um, so it's important to check for numbness and tingling in the small finger and check for ulnar nerve instability by moving the elbow and feeling if the nerve is sliding in and out of the groove. These patients frequently report more pain with heavy, lifting and heavy gripping and lifting, not so much a cup of coffee. Again, their motion should be about normal. Um, this mainly is, a, again, a tendinosis, not an inflammation problem, but more of a degenerative problem involving mainly the pronator tendon and the FCR tendon, which both insert on that flex on that medial epicondyle, excuse me. For me, the test here is, again, uh, that kind of the, that zombie position where their arms are straight out in front of them, holding them up strong. And I do resisted pronation to check that pronator teres muscle and tendon. And that generally causes a lot of pain directed right at the medial epicondyle. And when you have that, you can kind of confirm your diagnosis. Treatment for this, much like the tennis elbow, involves therapy, occasionally injection or PRP. Uh, you can use elbow pad or elbow brace and very, very, very rarely surgery. Okay, next slide. What about the um, veins? Common problem with wrist pain here. And again, patients will come in and say, it hurts when I move my thumb. I've got some swelling on my wrist. It's been two months. It, at times the pain's really sharp. They can't even move their thumb in certain directions. This is certainly common in people that are new moms or have a new job or even like new grandmas. Um, definitely more common in women than in men in the office. Um, also, I think there's a subset of men who are taking testosterone that do get uh, symptoms or have, I think, at a higher risk for this problem. So there's some type of hormonal component to it, certainly. Um, this is, technically speaking, an EPB tendonitis. So, what is, you know, there's some different physical exam maneuvers that you can use to identify this. Finkelstein's test is something we learned in medical school regarding this. I think a better test, however, is called the EPB entrapment test. I'll show you that in a minute. 
The reason that's better is because it, it this is often on the differential with thumb CMC arthritis, wrist arthritis, and decrepit tendonitis. They can all kind of present with the same constellation of symptoms. Again, finding the right diagnosis is critical here. Generally, don't need x-rays or advanced imaging, um, but the clinical exam, specifically the EPB entrapment test, is a great test. Treatment generally for this involves splinting, ice, ibuprofen. <clears throat> I think an injection here works very well. The one caveat is, is that unlike trigger finger, where you give an injection anywhere in the ballpark and it works, this injection needs to be in the tendon sheath. So it generally hurts and you should not be, you should not really see a big skin wheel when you put the medicine in if you want to try to maximize the benefit of injection. Along those same lines, injections here also may cause some secondary issues, specifically fat atrophy or a dimple, and also skin hypopigmentation, which can bother people. And again, when your injections in the subcutaneous tissue, that risk is a lot higher. When you have it in the sheath, again, the, the shot hurts, those risks are almost zero because the medicine's not in the sub-Q where it causes those issues. Kind of, you can hit next here, McKenna. Kind of similar to the thumb, patients have a very certain area of tenderness that you can keep going, um, where they point, and that's, you can see how close it is to the thumb base, but it's not in the right spot. So again, I think being specific with your exam and really being, uh, using that just a finger hip to pinpoint where the pain is, is very helpful here. You can go next slide. Boy, does that hurt? This is that EPB entrapment test. No, all the way. As far as it can go. Does that hurt? Yeah. Okay. Trigger. So one thing is on the left side is normal. On the right side, she has the query veins. And when you just right off the bat, before you even do anything, you notice that she cannot lift her right thumb, her right thumb up like she can her left thumb. So right now she, you know, she's got bad tendonitis, and bad to query veins. Just to kind of take home the diagnosis, you can push down on the thumb and you notice on the left side, it caused no symptoms. On the right side, she had, it caused pain and she said it went up to her wrist. So, you know, people complain with this problem of this diffuse pain, but really your exam can be very pinpoint to help confirm the diagnosis. What about a mucus cyst? Um, so these are common and ganglion cysts are very common in, in people and specifically in the hand surgery clinic. And we've all seen bumps in the back of the wrist, which is called a ganglion cyst. <laughs> this is called a mucus cyst. And I brought this up because I think it has some unique complications and some unique diagnostic challenges at times. <clears throat> um, it generally is associated with the DIP joint. Patients may have no complaints or they may complain of some soreness and pain. Generally it's mild. People often have gradual onset and they report that this mass or this bump may increase and decrease in size. For some people actually have drainage and the drainage specifically is a clear jelly, um, not serous, not pus. So it's very, you know, if it has clear jelly drainage, it's not a node, it's a mucus cyst. Both pictures here on the bottom right show nail ridging. Actually, all three of them do. And that's, that's pretty much pathognomonic for a digital mucus cyst. And you can see, and generally that ridge most of the time gets better when you remove the cyst surgically. The reason we, I bring this up is because there is a small risk of having infection in your joint when you have a cyst that occasionally drains or even with an injection into the cyst. So I try to avoid sticking a needle in these to drain them because you could be, potentially be inoculating the joint with bacteria and they have a septic joint, which is a, a challenge to treat and requires surgery and IV antibiotics for several weeks. Generally, my thought is if it doesn't bother them, it doesn't bother me. But if it is causing lots of pain or they've had drainage issues recently, it's something to consider surgery for. And the picture on the top right, you'll see a hand that's got some big bumps on the fingers. Those are not mucus cysts. And in fact, those are something called Heberden's nodes. And those are associated purely with DIP joint arthritis, but they are a very much a separate entity from a mucus cyst. And they really offer no risk of infection and they should not cause any nail ridging. So that's one way to, to differentiate um, the two things. Here, next slide. Paronychia. Um, very common infection involving the proximal nail fold or even the lateral nail fold. And patients often have a history of biting their nails or had a recent manicure a couple of days ago, 
and they come in with a painful swollen finger, specifically painful around the nail bed. They may have drainage, they may have pain, they may have even swelling and thinness in the pulp of their finger, but it is not a felon, it is a perinicia. If this is anything but acute, x-rays are important. This can, man this can translate into osteomyelitis relatively quicker, quickly in one to two weeks, especially those that have underlying diabetes or underlying medical conditions. Um, some people come in and they've had symptoms for off and on for three weeks, what well, can be an infection in the bone. So that obviously train, uh, affects management decisions there. Generally, these, you can try attempt aggressive non-op management, which for me includes warm soapy soaks. The idea is that you want to try to, with a warm compress, you're trying to get any pus out from under the fingernail or under the nail fold with oral antibiotics. <laughs> if that does not provide improvement in one to three days, generally uh, a procedure or a surgical intervention or in-office procedure is very successful. That generally involves partial nail plate removal. So simply putting a knife over the nail fold without taking the nail off does not really provide treatment. You have to get part of the nail off to let the infection truly drain. So when you make a little stab incision over the nail fold, I think essentially the symptoms recur. Your next slide. Um, this is an example of what I did in the office just recently. So for me, uh, I used a simple block here. What that means is that you put some lidocaine with or without epi, depending if I use epi, which is fine, but it says for subcutaneous <coughs> um, injection in the middle phalanx with local anesthesia with epi, lidocaine with epi, excuse me, and uh, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So you numb the finger up for starters. Um, you can hit next, please, McKenna. And hit click on that, it should play, hopefully. Um, so once the finger's numb, you, I use a freer generally or some kind of device to put between the nail fold and the nail plate. I'm trying to elevate the nail plate here. And I cover it so that I don't get sprayed with any pus or goop because that was a pretty angry looking one. So once you elevate the nail fold, you can kind of twist it up and that lets all that infection drain out. You didn't want to take a culture. So taking a culture is an important part of this. You hit next slide, McKenna. And click on that one more time. So you elevate the nail fold, you drain the infection. I generally have them wash their hand under warm soapy water just in the sink. And then I cut off a small segment of the nail so that it can continue to drain. This fella particularly had a bunch of dead skin that I just excised to allow for drainage. That's it. He was a nail biter. Uh, so, after we did that part, I had him wash it under soap and water in the sink and then put a dry dressing on it. And he got better with oral antibiotics after that. You go to the next slide. What about the simple block? This is one thing I think is a good take home message from the arm and hand team to all the arm, arm and hand providers is that when you want to anesthetize a finger, there's about 18 ways to do it, but there is one best way. And it, it, it's called the simple block. And it involves medicine, a one stick shot, in the fleshy part of the volar proximal phalanx, just beyond that volar crease. And you can put three to four cc's there and it will cause a great block to the entirety of the finger. <clears throat> and you put it just in the subcutaneous tissue, just under the skin, you should see, and you'll see a big wheel. If you're doing, if you can always add a little bit of extra medicine on top of the finger, but doing all these shots in the palm hurt a lot and shots in the web space hurt a lot. This shot does not hurt as much you want to pinch the skin really hard we can get the injection and it's very well tolerated and does a great digital block good next slide last thing wrist arthritis so uh, wrist arthritis has a lot of a lot of causes and it generally presents with insidious onset of pain sometimes there's a remote history of trauma but generally not people might have sharp pain with certain activities or gripping but also some aching at rest that's worse with activity the, case, the causes here are, are seemingly endless, but they include things like gout, pseudo gout, a ligament injury, scaphoid fractures, or very rarely post-traumatic change. Also those people that have like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, those type of people can develop a arthritis in their, in their wrist as well. On exam, 
Patients will absolutely have stiffness in the affected wrist, so you can measure the wrist by flexing it up and down and observing for a decrease in motion. Along those same lines, I like a test called the shake test, where literally you just put the hand straight and shake it back and forth, and that will cause elicit a lot of pain, and that indicates an intraarticular problem. They also likely have some visible fullness or swelling over the wrist, and treatment generally involves kind of bracing, perhaps uh, inflammatory medicines, steroid shots at times, um, sometimes activity modification or very rarely surgery. That's it for, uh, for my end. And I would open this up to any questions for you all regarding any things we talked about today. Um, happy to answer them. So I, I wrote down a couple things um, to kind of get this rolling. And so again, for everyone, if you would just enter your questions in the Q&A box, it makes it easier for us to follow if we get anything in. But um, one question I had, have you noticed an increase with the usage of smartphones and hand complaints, particularly in younger people? Hard to say, not, not directly, but I think there's, I think the thumb is not designed for some of the stuff we do with smartphones. And, and honestly, I'm an anecdotal evidence here, but my thumb hurts and it's definitely bothersome more if I'm using my phone. And it's because of that kind of hyperflexion that you put your thumb in when you're scrolling or looking through stuff. So anecdotally, maybe, but I don't think there's any direct causation that we've seen, you know, rolling through the office at this time. Because I know I had seen a study that there's an increase in cervical disc disease in young people from looking down at their phones. I believe that for sure. Um, so I, I didn't know if there were more hand issues as well, because it, it seems that that would also be correlated. Maybe they're playing less sports and doing more self stuff on their cell phone, so it's a trade off. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Until the coronary artery disease hits. Yeah, exactly. Um, so with the and with the um, Tenel and Thalen test, um, is that both or is one superior to the other? I think I, I don't consider one more superior to the other. I use them both as diagnostic tools. I'm sure those studies show different, you know, sensitivities and specificities for those tests. I think the Thalen is probably more specific for carpal tunnel. Um, but uh, sensitivity, hard to say, but I would imagine it's, that Phelan specifically is a better test for confirming a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, Tenelis is also a good test, but I can't give you a evidence based on, I haven't read the paper recently, talks about one versus the other. I use them both interchangeably and they both work well. And so one thing, and, and maybe I just missed it, but if one of those is positive, then it's more than likely carpal tunnel or is it um, if you have one that is completely asymptomatic and the other that shows symptoms, then it, you know, I'd say some patients have a grossly positive Phalens after 20 seconds and have no tenels. And then you say, oh, do your hands wake you up at night? Is it mainly your thumb and long finger going numb? That's 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 confirmation in my book. So okay. I don't need both of them to be positive to confirm the diagnosis. And in fact, some people have either for some reason absent tenels or no, no problem there, but then their failings is positive or vice versa. Okay. Because um, I know that not everyone's bodies read the medical books and know how they're yeah. supposed to react. So we often get conflicting evidence. So um, since we're talking about carpal tunnel, um, what's the deciding factor on surgical intervention or the conservative treatments? I, you know, People that are of working age and have persistent numbness, or persistent dysesthesia, where they say, doc, for the past two months, my fingers, my thumb and lung finger always feel numb. If they're a working age person, I consider surgery for them. You know, if some people come in and they're 80 and they say, I don't feel my fingers at all, but it doesn't hurt and I'm fine. And they have atrophy. And I say, you know what? You know, you don't need surgery. It may offer you minimal benefit anyway. So I think generally if they have nighttime waking and that's it, a brace is a great idea. If they have nighttime waking and some daytime numbness that's sporadic, a brace and maybe an injection is a good idea. Um, you know, for those that had visible atrophy or numbness and tingling all the time, I think those are the people that, that generally I do not necessarily consider conservative management with. So um, with the um, tennis and golfer's elbow, sure. what imaging and when? I think 
most of the time, clinical diagnosis and history help. And when it's clear cut, I think it's clear cut. For those that have had symptoms for eight months to a year, and it's kind of not necessarily, they're not getting a great response to those options. You know, I think an x-ray is reasonable after three months, certainly. You know, I, I save MRIs for when I think, hey, nothing else is helping, or you're still miserable a year out. Maybe something else is going on. Maybe you need surgery. But I think x-ray is a reasonable test to do if there's if it's not clear cut when, when they come into the office um, or if they've had symptoms for a couple of weeks or even two or three months and they haven't responded yet. And with the with lateral epicondylitis, what about the, the bands that change the tension point on the, the bands are great. Actually, I was look, reading stuff yesterday. So that that's de there's definitely showed significant clinical improvement using this. It's called a, the band works well and a wrist brace works well. So, I mean, I encourage all my patients. They all get those to start off with. And, and I, you know, the, the, there's definitely good evidence saying those provide pain relief. And that's the goal. I mean, my goal is to make the pain better and then let the, let the disease run its course is the idea. So you can kind of minimize their dysfunction, then hope the disease burns itself out and they're in good shape. So I'm all about the, the counterforce brace or the wristband and the wrist brace as well. Yeah, I'd, it, that's good to hear because I've recommended those for years and oh, they're, they're great. Um, wanted to make sure, A, that I was doing the right thing. But also the, the thing that I really told patients, because the vast majority where they didn't work, it's because they were sitting on a shelf and not on their sure. arm. And yeah. you know, I, I tell them that that buying it isn't what fixes it. It's actually yeah. taking the tension off and they needed to actually wear it. I think I would, when you, I think it's also good. Sometimes people put them in the wrong spot or don't really know where to wear them. So it's nice to say, hey, you have this brace put on, let's see where you wear it. And it's like, well, that's in a pretty good spot or maybe that's wear off. So you want it just somewhere in that kind of muscle belly, maybe anywhere between five to 10 centimeters distal, excuse me, distal to the proc, to the lateral condyle. So if you put it there, it should help them. Yeah, I, I usually try to give them a pretty good reminder and say, okay, right here and press and say, right here's where you're tender. You want it below there. Yeah. That's, that, that, <laughs> they that's, remember that's where it is you pressed <laughs> when it's tender. That's a good point. I like that. So right now I don't see any other questions. I think you did a great job. And I know that we, um, we really learned a lot. I, this is something that does come across in primary care. I, I mean, if not on a daily basis, at least weekly, one of these complaints that, that you addressed today. So I appreciate your time.